Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen is in the spotlight here in Canada tonight. Hansen is poised to become the first Canadian ever to venture to the moon. He's part of NASA's Artemis II mission, which was slated for November, but has now been delayed until 2025. Here's part of our conversation. And joining me now, Canadian astronaut Jeremy Hansen. Good to chat with you again. So listen, I, I heard that this adventure into space all started way back when, when you were a kid and you saw a photo. Tell me about that. Yeah, it's crazy to think about this. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I think it's so important to you know share the inspiration of things like space exploration with our youth. But my mom tells me I was five. I, I couldn't have told you the age, but I do have the very distinct recollection of um, looking through Encyclopedia A. I was interested in airplanes. I would go on that encyclopedia a lot. Um, and one day I flipped across Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, first human on the moon. And I saw this picture of a human being standing on the moon and it just blew up my perspective of things. And I went back to that page so many times in my childhood, it's like burned in my brain. And it just made me think, wow, I'd love to be a space explorer. I turned my tree house into a spaceship. Yeah. And I started exploring space in my imagination and I never looked back. What did that, what did that picture symbolize to you as a kid? Well, I think, you know, it's hard for me to know for sure, but what I think it did is it opened my mind to what was possible. Like the fact that humans left Earth, traveled to the moon, left blueprints, and came back. That was mind-blowing for me. <laughs> it was clear. And then, you know, the, that I could make that leap to be like, oh, okay, well, a rocket is sort of like my treehouse, and, you know, my treehouse could launch and fly into space and go to the moon. That's what that did for me. And here you are today. I, I know that you also have said that growing up on a farm, which you did, really helped you uh, as an astronaut. Can you explain what you mean by that? Such incredible respect for farmers because they're just um, people that get in there and get the job done. They deal with a lot of challenge on a regular basis and they just never quit. And so growing up at a farm, I just watched my father and other people working on the farm just dig into problems and solve them. Something breaks, you find a solution. If you have the right part, great. If you don't, then you make shift something to make it work. Mm. You know, whatever it is, the crops still have to come off the field or the animals still need to get fed. Just because you don't have the perfect part doesn't mean uh, those things stop. It's got to go forward. And I learned that kind of resilience and hard work and the value of hard work. I had to work hard as a kid on the farm if I wanted to, to be employed and keep up with my dad and uh, that has paid off. You also had to work hard when you were a fighter pilot in the Royal Canadian uh, Air Force. What did you learn when you were there doing that job, lessons that you take now? There's many. Um, in fact, I'm wearing uh, my 100th anniversary of the Royal Canadian Air Force patch uh, here tonight because this year we're celebrating 100 years since the Royal Canadian Air Force was formed. It'll be on April 1st. And uh, well, you know, one of the things that I learned was just to respect what all the people who have come before me have done, the sacrifices that were made, and to walk in their footsteps is a big calling to be part of the Canadian Armed Forces. Uh, specifically as a F-18 pilot, one of the things that I learned that I'll take with me on this journey is how to overcome emergency situations, how to deal with them, how to sort of set my fear aside. You know, the fear is there. I mean, I'm human, I get scared of things, but I have to set the fear aside and work the problem, implement my training. And I had numerous situations uh, when I was flying CF-18s where I had to execute that. And it gave me that confidence that it's okay, I can work through these things. I sort of can set that fear aside, compartmentalize it and work the problem. And hmm. now I know as a crew, if we're up there and we're on our way to the moon and we have a problem, we will either solve the problem or we will die trying, but we won't be curled up in a ball in the corner complaining about it, we'll be actively working the problem. It's so interesting to hear you say that, that, that you still have that fear factor there, but you just know how to deal with it now. Let, let's talk about Artemis II. And uh, you know, I know that the mission is very complex, but bring it down to earth if you can, and tell us as simply as you can the mission for Artemis II. Yeah, Artemis II is the first time we fly this capsule with humans on it, and it's a precursor for Artemis three and four and five, where we'll take humans back and land on the moon. In those missions, in the future, we will have a lunar lander, but it's not ready yet. And so for Artemis II, we just take this capsule and the four of us, and we launch off Earth 
We'll fly around the Earth once in about 90 minutes, and that'll give us a chance to look at the capsule, do a few quick tests, make sure we're happy with it. If we are, we'll do a burn. So we'll raise our altitude. We'll go out to 60,000 kilometers around the planet and come back. That'll take about a day. And during that day, we're going to do a whole bunch more tests. We're going to do some manual flying of the capsule, proving that it can rendezvous and dock with another spacecraft, which will be needed in the future, mm -hmm. and, uh, and make sure all the life support systems are ready for the remaining eight days to get to the moon and back. And then will come back, it's going to be incredible. I mean, that view is going to be something because when we go out to 60,000 kilometers, we will see the whole marble of Earth hanging in space. And then we'll come racing back in you know, over the next 12 hours, and it'll be as if we're coming home. But just before we hit the atmosphere, we'll burn the engine again if everything is good, and then we'll zip out to the moon, four days <laughs> to the moon, fly around it, see an Earth rise, and then fly back and splash down in the Pacific Ocean. And the whole idea for anyone who followed the Apollo program, you know, they did Apollo 7 where they tested their capsule in Earth orbit. Mm -hmm. And then they did Apollo 8, that historic mission where they flew to the moon and they went into lunar orbit, flew around the moon a bunch of times. Well, we're trying in a safe way to combine both of those missions into one. And that's why we have this very unique mission profile. But yeah. it's going to be something. You know, nobody has ever trained for a mission like this. Uh, obviously, you know, the life support system, all of this stuff is very crucial, very sensitive. Does it ever make you, do you ever get nervous? Yeah, I don't, I'm, I, I don't know how to describe it other than I'm not nervous today. I can't be nervous for, you know, two years uh, <laughs> waiting for a mission. Um, that wouldn't be any way to live. So I don't feel nervous on any given day, but I look at things, uh, you know, we talk about this all the time. Yeah. I look at systems and I'm like, okay, that one fails, okay, we have a backup, that one fails, yeah, that's loss of crew. And you know, we are constantly looking at those things. For anything that we think is loss of crew for a failure, we always wanna have at least one backup system, ideally. There are a few places where what we would call zero fault tolerant, where you know, if, it, if it fails, then you may lose the crew, but they're pretty rare. You know, heat shield's one of those. You know, the heat shield either works or it doesn't work. There's not really any in, in between. Um, on, on the heat shield, for example. But for most systems, we have a backup system, which gives us a lot of comfort. Um, and then you just, you work with this team. I mean, they're pretty extraordinary and uh, it gives you a lot of confidence that, you know, there are things that could get you, but all in all, we think uh, we think we have a really good chance of uh, launching, going out to the moon and landing safely and being breathing uh, nine days later in the Pacific Ocean. I want to talk to you a little bit about being a Canadian down there in Houston right now training. Do you feel kind of an extra sense of responsibility representing a nation? Um, I mean, I suppose I do when you put it that way. <laughs> I guess I do. Hey, uh, I, you know, by and large, the sentiment that I have, though, is pride. Yeah. Um, I'm really proud of Canada. Um, you know, we're a small country population wise, um, you know, relatively small GDP. But we're a really successful country, and this is, you know, this is not the only indicator of that, but this is one of those indicators. We're the second country in the world to send a human into deep space. Why? It's got nothing to do with me. It's got everything to do with thousands of Canadians over decades who had visionary goals that they set, and they held those visions, and they pushed through the obstacles and the barriers, and they brought us to this point where Canada can offer enough value to an international partnership where we've been invited to be the second country in the world to fly a human in deep space. It's a huge head nod to Canada, a huge compliment. And I'm, I find myself just really proud that we can stand here. It wasn't a gift. Um, you know, I, I credit American leadership for this routinely because it is extraordinary leadership. They didn't need Canada to do this, that's clear. But they chose to make space for people to bring their gifts and their genius. And Canada rose to that challenge. And uh, it's a good reminder for us because you know, we're here for, because of decisions we've made over decades and, you know, decisions we made years ago. But we have to constantly remind ourselves that we have to continue to be visionary. We have to continue to set big goals. And our people and our country, our extraordinary people will rise to that challenge and create amazing solutions that we need both in space and on the planet. Well, you have certainly uh, boosted interest in Canada's uh, space program. Uh, as a nation, how do we continue to build on that? How do we continue to build a robust space program in Canada? Yeah, it's simple and, and hard all at the same time. Um, the simple aspect of it is that 
what we just keep doing what we've always done. So we look for areas where the problems that we face on the planet overlap with what we have to solve in space. And uh, so that means that we can sort of do two for one, if you will. So there's a couple areas that we're working on that are relatively new that are really interesting. So food. So if eventually if we want to go to Mars or even have a sustainable presence on the moon, we, we have to grow food there. Well, if we can't grow food in the Canadian Arctic, there's no way we can do it on the moon. So we're looking at solving that problem on the planet partnering with people that live in these remote communities, with indigenous Inuit communities, to teach us to learn together how to grow food in these harsh environments and then take those lessons to the moon. We're doing the same with health. So if we're going to send astronauts to deep space, we're going to need to change how we deliver health care in space. Well, with the technology of the 2020s, we can also make big leaps with how we deliver health care on the planet. So this is another area that we're looking at. Hey, let's solve it here on the planet and take those lessons to space with our international partnership. Robotics is another area that we're focusing on. Obviously, you look on the back of the $5 bill and robot, space robotics is one of our niche areas, but it is an up and coming commercialized opportunity for Canada. And so you want for all these, you know, these um, commercial space stations that are going to be built. You want Canada Arm on these space stations. When you look at um, spacecraft going to Mars, you want Canadian robotics on those spacecraft. And so why? Because it contributes to the economy. It keeps us at the leading edge of space robotics. We have it right now, but there are opportunities for us to grow our space economy, our chunk of that, uh, that pie, here in Canada. There's a lot of innovation happening by private companies as well when it comes to space. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, you know, the, the evolution of space tourism and also the commercialization of space. Yeah, I absolutely love it. I mean, there's always challenges as things change and there'll be ups and downs and bumps in the road for sure. But by and large, it's uh, it's a huge win. Um, the whole idea of government programs typically is to buy down the risk until commercial entities can accept those responsibilities and carry them forward. So, you know, they're often able to be more agile, move more quickly. And so as soon as you can transition things to commercial, you know, in a way that serves your population, that's a win. Um, and so any money that gets spent by space tourists is helping us with respect to buying down the cost of launch of everything that we're doing. As uh, commercial interest uh, increases for lunar exploration, that buys down our costs. We're sort of sharing the cost of going back to the moon. You have said that the, the thing that you're looking forward to the most when you get up in space is looking back down on this little planet that we call Earth. Not pe many people get that perspective. What do you think that's going to be like? I don't know. I've thought about it quite a bit. It's hard to know what it'd be like. My my colleagues that have been to space um, and seen the Earth from the International Space Station, you know, that's only 400 kilometers above the surface. Remember, I told you, even on our, our second orbit of the Earth, we're going to go to 60,000 kilometers. I mean, it's vastly different. But my friends that have seen it from 400 kilometers, um, you know, the way they describe it is that even though they'd seen videos and pictures, it still completely blew them away. I know I'm going to be blown away. Uh, on the other hand, I, I know it's only just going to reinforce something that I already believe is that, you know, we are one species on this planet. Humanity has to work together. It's going to reinforce that. I think this is one of the things that I love about the space program is that it, it demonstrates, it points back to us. It says, look, you can do great things, humans, if you set big goals and you work together. If you create instead of destroy together, you can do extraordinary things. When I look back at the planet, I know I'm going to be thinking about that. And I'm already passionate about it, but I'm going to come back with a renewed sense of of that need for humanity to work together. I think you and I would agree on this, that if you watch the news right now, you're not okay with how humanity is doing. It's not good enough. We can do a lot better. And Artemis II isn't gonna fix that, unfortunately, but I do, I do hope that during Artemis II, that people will just pick their heads up for a moment and reflect upon those types of thoughts, that realization that we are ultimately got to this place because of people collaborating. And as soon as we figure out how to all collaborate, we're going to significantly improve our existence on this planet and on other planets in our solar system. 
You are doing extraordinary things, Mr. Hansen. We certainly appreciate you chatting with us here tonight. Yeah, it's my absolute pleasure. And I'm just so proud of Canada for putting us in this position. And, uh, and I know it's going to pay dividends for our youth looking at this opportunity and realizing the sorts of things that they can achieve in their future because of it. Thanks very much. Thank Take you. Care. Take care.